Today we are looking at a case from the late 19th century. So sit back as we go to Australia. Madame Olga Radowski was born in Melbourne in 1869. She was the daughter of a publican. Olga was not her real name. She had been christened Elizabeth Elburn, but as she grew older, she would tell people that her name was Olga. She found this name to be more exotic and would say that her family were originally from Russia. When Olga was old enough to leave home, she went to live in a nice house at 73 Osborne Street in South Yarra. And here she set up a business as a palmist and a futurist. In the mid to late 19th century, there was an ongoing fascination with palm reading and having your future told was a popular pastime. It was difficult for Olga to pay the rent at the house by palm reading alone. So another young lady moved in to help her cover the cost. She was named Tekla de Berka. Her parents had come to Australia from Germany and made money by keeping a herd of cows and selling milk at the markets. Tekla was one of 10 children and her family were known to be respectable and hardworking. Before she joined Olga, she had worked in domestic service, but now she was 19 years old and the turn of the century was approaching. She wanted to take advantage of the new and improved opportunities that were available for young ladies in Melbourne. Neighbours, however, would often complain of strange noises coming from the house and claim that there would be a regular stream of gentlemen callers, one of whom was a doctor named Dr. William Gaze, who was often seen visiting Tekla at the house. Another regular visitor was a local real estate agent named Travis Todd. Although he would call in an official capacity, as he had the job of collecting the weekly rent from Olga, there were whispers in the neighbourhood that she paid a reduced rent as neighbours believed that Olga and Tekla would make sure that young Travis was suitably looked after on each visit. Travis would collect the rent from many people and one of the houses he would visit was lived in by a widowed lady named Mrs Ambrose. She lived in South Yarra with her three children, the eldest of whom was a 17-year-old daughter named Mabel. Mabel was employed as a seamstress and domestic servant and she worked hard to help her mother. The family's fortunes had changed when Mabel's father, who had worked as a telegraph operator, had died of typhoid. Her mother had then moved the family to the small impoverished property in South Yarra. Things were very difficult for Mrs Ambrose and following the death of her husband, she found it hard to provide for her children. She was known to drink and the family lived a very much hand to mouth existence. Eventually the authorities removed the two younger children from her care and placed them into an industrial school, which was where children who were deemed to be neglected were usually sent. Mabel's behaviour didn't help her mother's pleas to get her two younger children returned. She worked, but her behaviour when she wasn't working had been considered questionable. A local Victorian state police constable named Constable Organ had previously raised his concerns as to the character of the company she was keeping. One of the gentlemen Mabel would spend time with was the young real estate agent, Travis Todd. But Mabel's mother actually liked Travis and approved of her daughter spending time with him. She was hoping that Travis may actually propose to Mabel as she thought that this would mean that she may be able to escape her impoverished life. But unbeknown to Mrs Ambrose, Travis Todd had no intention of marrying her daughter. To him, his relationship with Mabel was more like a casual fling. And in fact, he was already engaged to another young lady from a far more affluent family. But Travis's irresponsible behaviour towards young Mabel soon caused him great concern when she announced that she was pregnant. She may have hoped that Travis would do the honourable thing and marry her, but instead he decided to take her to see Madame Olga Adalski. At the time in Australia, terminations were illegal Nevertheless, it was possible to find places that would perform them. These were usually ran by untrained practitioners, using quite primitive methods, very often in unsanitary conditions. They were also quite expensive. 
Travis was aware that Olga offered certain medical treatments for pregnant young ladies that were designed to cause a miscarriage. Mabel soon moved into the house in Osborne Street and Olga started to treat her with her plant-based remedies, which contained such things as polygramets and parsley. However, nothing worked and Mabel remained pregnant. Olga suggested to Travis that he obtained a more effective substance, so asked him to get some ergot. This is a fungus that grows on rye and was believed to assist on bringing on a miscarriage. Travis managed to get an ergot-based medicine and Olga gave it to Mabel, but again, it did not have the desired effect. Travis was now becoming worried. He knew that if Mabel had his baby, it would end his engagement and his opportunity to climb the social ladder would be lost. On the 13th of December, Olga started to administer an electric treatment, which at the end of the 19th century had become a popular method to help women who had unwanted pregnancies. This consisted of a battery with wires and connectors and produced a painful shock. But at first it seemed to have little effect on Mabel. Olga intensified the treatment, but Mabel started to scream out in pain. This was not what Olga needed, as her neighbours were very quick to complain about any strange goings on in her house. As Mabel's screams grew louder, Olga grew increasingly more worried about the noise, so she put her hand over Mabel's mouth to dull her screams. Mabel's screams then became fainter until they stopped completely. For a brief moment, Olga thought that her eccentric methods had worked, but then she suddenly realised that Mabel Ambrose was no longer breathing. Along with Tekla, she desperately tried to revive her. They warmed her body with hot water bottles and poured brandy down her throat, but nothing worked. And after a few minutes, they realised that Mabel Ambrose was dead. Tekla rushed to see Dr Gaze and asked him to come immediately to the house. Dr Gaze obliged, and when he arrived, he was confronted with a very distressed household. Olga was hysterical, and Travis, who had returned to the house, was extremely worried. Dr Gaze looked at Mabel and confirmed that she was indeed dead. Olga then asked him if he would issue her with a death certificate, but Dr Gaze said that he would not, and instead he advised them to report Mabel's death to the authorities. Reporting the death, however, would undoubtedly lead to an investigation and the police would soon realise that Olga was carrying out an illegal act in her house, which had resulted in the death of a young woman. She could hang. Travis was also in no way an innocent party. He had arranged everything, purchased medicines, and although not in the house when Mabel had died, he had certainly aided Olga. He would surely be prosecuted and his reputation would be ruined. Olga and Travis sat down to decide what to do. They were both agitated and nervous. They did not want to go to the authorities, but could not keep Mabel's body in the house. Eventually, they came up with a plan. They cut off Mabel's hair in order to try to conceal her identity. They then put the body in a sack and Travis fetched a large wooden box known as a boot box and together they placed the body into the box. The following evening, under the cover of darkness, Travis and Tekla carried the box to the riverbank. They weighed it down with stones and carefully pushed it into the river. Then, thinking that the box had sank, they returned to the house. Three days later, on the 17th of December, 1898, three boys playing near the river saw a wooden box floating towards them. They managed to get it to the embankment and curious to find out what it contained. They opened it, but when they peered inside, they were confronted with the grisly sights of a decomposing body. The boys rushed to the police station and informed the constable on duty of their discovery. Soon police officers arrived at the scene and an investigation began to find out the identity of the body in the box. Newspapers were fascinated with the story and dubbed the case the boot trunk tragedy. The police, however, were finding it very difficult to identify the victim 
Reports of missing women were investigated, but none could be identified as the woman found in the box. Without any leads or any name for the deceased, the police decided to make the body available at the mortuary for the public to view in the hope that someone may recognise the victim. The case had captured the imagination of everyone in Melbourne and long queues soon formed outside the mortuary building as people waited patiently to get a glimpse of the corpse. Among the visitors was Travis Todd. The public display of the body, however, didn't produce any more leads. So eventually, as the body continued to decompose, the police buried it, but preserved the head in alcohol, put it in a jar and left it on display. Mrs. Ambrose, Mabel's mother, had not visited the mortuary. Although she had not seen or heard from her daughter for some time, Travis had always told her that Mabel was living in a very respectable house in South Yarra, and Mrs. Ambrose had no reason to believe that the young man was not telling her the truth. A hotel owner went to see the head that was now on display and thought that it looked like a young woman that had previously visited his establishment. He informed the local constable. Constable Organ had always believed that the woman was probably a local girl from a poor neighbourhood. The coroner's report had stated that the body was of a woman in her 30s, but Constable Organ had kept an open mind on the age of the victim. When the hotel owner described the young lady that he thought the head resembled, the constable thought that it may be Mabel Ambrose. He visited her mother, who informed him that Mabel was staying at 73 Osborne Street. Constable Organ then made his way to the house of Madame Olga Rodowski. He knocked on the door and soon it was opened by Tekla de Berka. He asked her if she knew where Mabel Ambrose was, to which Tekla replied that Mabel had gone away to the countryside, that she had got married. Constable Organ thought this odd. Tekla offered no more details. He knew that Mrs Ambrose had not heard from her daughter since mid-December, so he told Tekla that he would make further inquiries and would speak to her again. The constable returned to speak to Mrs Ambrose and persuaded her to accompany him to the mortuary. She looked intensely at the head in the jar, and despite the fact that it looked very different to how she remembered her beautiful daughter, the tearful lady confirmed to the constable that she believed it was Mabel. The police then returned to 73 Osborne Street and arrested Olga Radowski, Tekla Duberka, and Travis Todd. When being questioned, Tekla soon gave a statement confirming that the body was that of Mabel Ambrose. She then went on to tell the police everything that happened on the 13th of December, 1898. With Tekla's statement, the police charged Travis Todd and Olga Radowski with the murder of Mabel Ambrose. Following the identification of the deceased, the original inquest that had been adjourned before Christmas 1898 was resumed on the 25th of January 1899. Many witnesses were called to give evidence and when it ended, it was agreed that Olga Radowski should stand trial for the murder of Mabel Ambrose, while Tekla de Berka, Travis Todd and Dr William Gaze should all stand trial for being accessories before the fact. The trial took place at the Melbourne Supreme Court on the 22nd of February, 1899. The press and the public were fascinated by the case. A large crowd gathered outside the courthouse and admission was strictly by ticket only. Due to the mass interest in the case, even the side galleries of the courtroom were opened. Mrs Ambrose told the court that whenever she asked Travis about her daughter, he would always say that she was living with a respectable family. Tekla's evidence was crucial. She proved to be a solid witness. Before the trial ended, she was discharged, meaning only Olga, Travis and Dr Gaze were left to face the jury's verdict. After three days, the trial ended and the jury retired to deliberate. A large crowd gathered outside the courts. The press and public waited patiently and at 9.35 p.m. the jury returned. When the judge asked the jury foreman if they found the defendant, Olga Radowski, 
guilty or not guilty? The foreman replied, guilty. When he asked the same question of Travis Todd, the foreman replied, guilty. But in both cases, the foreman stated that the jury recommended mercy. However, the jury found the other defendant, Dr. William Gaze, not guilty on all charges. The jury believed that there had not been any premeditated intention to commit murder. Nevertheless, the judge sentenced both Olga and Travis to death. The defence appealed the sentence and eventually Olga's sentence was commuted to 10 years in prison and Travis's sentence was commuted to six years hard labour. Two years after the trial, Tekla de Berka got married and moved to Western Australia. Hello everyone and thank you so much for listening. As per usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have and I will see you in the next brief case.